so this is the Lotus Elise. Uh, this is the Tesla Roadster. Um, uh, as uh, as some of you probably know, uh, the two are have very similar exterior, not by accident. The Tesla Roadster borrowed its exterior design from the Lotus Elise, and and so Lotus Elise, uh, if you think of Tesla Roadster as the gas, uh, as the electric version of the Lotus Elise, and so to compare these two cars, uh, we can compare the curb weight of the car, which is the total weight of the car, with a full tank of gasoline in the case of the Lotus Elise. With a, with a fully charged battery pack in the case of the Tesla Roadster. And you immediately see the problem. The Tesla Roadster weighs about 400 kilograms more than Lotus Elise. Right? This, this really shows why gasoline is so phenomenal. Right? It's, it's, it's tough to compete with gasoline on energy density. And this is the real, the real culprit for this 400 kilogram weight is essentially the battery pack, which contains about 6,800 lithium ion cells. Uh, and so uh, it gives you a reasonable driving range, but the battery is uh, the battery is also expensive and heavy. Right? So one would like to think of ways to make these batteries at the least lighter and, and hopefully cheaper also. So <coughs> where can we look? where can we go? What, what I show here is energy density for a variety of battery compounds. Here I have lead acid, which is the battery of the past. Uh, you have lithium ion, which is at 160 watt hours per kilogram, um, and you have uh, then advanced lithium ion batteries, which are lithium sulfur, and then two open systems, zinc air and lithium air. So zinc air, the the, the primary non-rechargeable version of uh, zinc air batteries, is known. Uh, we use it in, in uh, hearing aids, uh, and so zinc air is of course also attractive for uh, for. Uh, electric vehicles. One that is extremely attractive is lithium air and, and the reason it is is because you combine one of the most electropositive metals, lithium, with oxygen. So then you get a huge uh, gain in energy density from lithium ion batteries um, and so theoretically this is only counting the weight of lithium because you can presumably breathe air from the outside. You have a very very high energy density theoretically and off the order of gasoline. Uh, this is a this, this practical number is a wildly optimistic number that IBM pushed uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll get through the talk and, and put some reality into this number. Okay, I describe here uh, the architecture of a non aqueous lithium air battery uh, and this is the most attractive of the, the lithium air options. The, the, the non aqueous lithium air battery works in the following way. You have a lithium metal uh, at the anode and then you have, uh, you have some particles here, uh, these, are, these are carbon particles, uh, and then you have oxygen that is fed in, and then uh, in the, in, during discharge, you have lithium that undergoes oxidation, uh, becomes Li+, plus, uh, floats through, and then goes to the, the cathode, the electrons flow through the external circuit, and then you have oxygen coming in, and then electrons from the external circuit, so two of them, so two lithium plus and two electrons combine to form lithium peroxide. It's important that this is lithium peroxide. Um, and then you charge it back. Uh, lithium peroxide uh, essentially decomposes. You form Li plus, and oxygen evolves out. Electrons, uh, electrons go back. And then electrons go back and then combine with lithium to form lithium. So this forms the discharge cycle. This forms the charging cycle. Now what is important to note in, in, uh, in lithium air batteries is lithium peroxide is insoluble in the solution. So in the solution of organic electrolytes that are used, lithium peroxide is insoluble. So what that means is when you discharge the battery, what you're doing is essentially growing thicker and thicker films of lithium peroxide. Right? So what that means is it's different from traditional catalysis where you have, a, you, have a, you have a catalyst particle and you have reactions that happen at the catalyst particle. But in this case, what happens is you don't have traditional catalysis, you have some uh, so you have, you, have, you, have, you have some period where it sees the catalyst particle, but beyond that, it's growth of lithium peroxide on top of lithium peroxide. Right? The nicest way to see this is the following experiment. This was done by collaborators at IBM. This is this is a, what is called a, a capacity curve. What, what, what is plotted here is the potential measured versus lithium lithium plus as a function of uh, charge or capacity. And so this is in units of milliampere hour. Um, and these are constant current experiments, so this is essentially a time axis. So it's how long I've discharged the battery. And what you see immediately is independent of, uh, so this is the discharge, this is the charge, 
And beyond the small, beyond the first phase, which is the nucleation phase, you have the same features, universal, independent of what catalyst you use. This is XC72, which is a kind of carbon. This is gold on XC72, manganese oxide on XC72. So what this basically says is the underlying discharge and charging processes are governed by growth and, and etching of lithium peroxide. So the cycle efficiency is really determined by growth and, and etching. And so uh, my entire talk will basically be focused on trying to explain all these features of this, curve, this, this capacity curve. Okay, so first thing what we want to do is to understand what is the distance between the discharge and the charge. Right? So what we want to do is to try and understand what is the growth dynamics and the etching dynamics. Right? So what, uh, what it is, uh, is essentially a problem of crystal growth where what we have is we have oxygen coming in, we have Li plus coming in, and then <coughs> electrons. Now these electrons have to flow through lithium peroxide, I'll come back to why this is important, and then these three react at the reactive site to form lithium peroxide. So this is growth of lithium peroxide on top of lithium peroxide. Now this is my one slide uh, validation of the methodology. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a plot of the free energy, uh, actually the binding energy per oxygen of a whole host of oxides. Uh, traditional density functional theory based methods are, 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 uh, are notorious for getting oxides um, described poorly, but for these class of oxides, what we show is the calculated uh, heat of formation, which is the experimental heat of formation, there is a reasonable predictability. So what, what is shown here is superoxides, these are peroxides, and these are oxides. And and although there's not a one to one one to one correspondence, so that that's the y equals x y for the calculated versus experimental, there's a slope. But what we can at least take away from this is that we can get trends between <coughs> materials reasonably well. And and so uh, you can think of all the analysis I present as as accurate to about ten percent uh, uh, quantitative. Now what we want to do now is to try and understand growth of lithium peroxide. And so we want to try and understand what the mechanism is. So at the anode, we know that Li plus and electrons are in equilibrium with lithium metal. So what that means is I can replace the free energy of lithium plus and free energy of electrons by the free energy of lithium metal. So that gives me a way to calculate the free energy of these two species. Then what we want to do is to try and understand the cathode reaction. The cathode reaction is where now I add lithium plus an electron sequentially to oxygen. So I, I, I add a combination of lithium plus an electron to oxygen to form LiO2, and this is on a surface site. The surface site is on an already nucleated film of lithium peroxide, and then you undergo another addition of lithium plus an electrons, and you form Li2O2. <coughs> and of course, this is a solid because it's insoluble, so you're growing thicker and thicker films. Right? Okay, so, um, what we have is essentially a complicated high dimensional problem because we want to understand the problem of crystal growth. And so crystal growth can happen through many different ways. So one thing that, that uh, one, one possibility is you have nucleation on a terrace site. Uh, one other possibility is you nucleate on a step site. Uh, you can nucleate on a king site or you can diffuse from a terrace site to a step site and then nucleate there or diffuse from a step site, go to a king site and nucleate there. Right? Uh, and similar story during charge where you etch on a, on a terrace site or etch on a step site or etch on a kick site. Now, in electrochemical crystal growth, uh, we're saved by the fact that the, the reactions will run on the sites that, that have the lowest over potential. So the ones that have the, the lowest uh, thermodynamic and kinetic barrier, those are, the, those are the places where the reactions will run the fastest. And so I'll show you a representative, uh, representative uh, Set of uh, set of calculations on a king site, on a step site, on a terrace site, and and we've of course explored a whole host of these things, and they all the trends are more or less similar. Now um, let's first look at what happens on a king site, and before I do that, uh, I'll introduce a concept that I will go I will use over and over again. So I'll, I'll go over this part slowly. Uh, what I show here is the voltmeter. The voltmeter reads zero, so this is zero on the lithium lithium plus scale. So zero versus lithium, lithium plus, it is downhill in free energy to take four Li plus and four electrons to oxygen and put them in lithium peroxide. So the lithium would rather reside in lithium peroxide than as Li plus. Now, what you do as you increase the potential is essentially change the free energy of the electron. 
right? So you, you change the free energy of the electron by E times U, minus EU rather. So uh, you bring down the free energy of these different species. So uh, the, the reactant, the, the intermediate species are exactly the ones that I wrote down in the previous mechanism, LiO2 and, and Li2O2 and other species. And so what you do is <coughs> when you increase the potential, you increase the free energy, uh, you, you, you lower the free energy of these electrons, and you hit a potential. This is 2.54 on the lithium-lithium plus axis. This is the highest potential at which this reaction scheme is still downhill in free energy. Right? So why is this important? Well, this can be thought of as a thermodynamic limit for when this reaction would be expected to proceed at high rate. Right? There could be other kinetic barriers on top of it, but this is a minimum, this is a, this is a necessary requirement, it's not a sufficient requirement, but this is a necessary requirement to understand when this reaction scheme will run at high rate. And so this actually runs at 2.54 volts uh, uh, on a kink side. Uh, the equilibrium potential is about 2.66, so it runs at a, a very small over potential of 0.12. Uh, so it basically discharges at a kink side at an over potential of 0.12. It, we can do the charging process, which is etching, and this runs at about 0.19, right? Which is quite surprising because I started out telling you all this bad things about option electrochemistry with protons, where you needed to pay a 0.4 volt penalty no matter what, either way, right? Here, somehow you're able to beat this limit, right? and 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 why is this the case? This is the case because you're actually forming lithium peroxide and not lithium oxide. Why is this important? Because lithium peroxide keeps the oxygen oxygen bond intact. So what that means is the, the reaction scheme basically does not break any oxygen oxygen bond, and that's really the major cause <coughs> for all the problems with oxygen electrochemistry with protons. We'll come back to that later. So you can discharge and charge at the kink or very low O potentials. What about the story on a step side? On a step side, the story is exactly similar. You can discharge on a step side at about 0.1 volts. You can form a kink, which is essentially uh, uh, you can charge on a, on, a, on a step, basically at 0.15 volts. Now on a terrace, the story gets a little bit more complicated. To form an island on a terrace, uh, it costs slightly higher over potential. This is not surprising because the terrace, you want to break the extended symmetry of the, uh, of the terrace side, so you pay a higher penalty. This is 0.68 volts. Uh, the pit formation is 0.2. But what I said earlier comes into play because the sites that have the lowest over potentials are the ones that will dominate in later. Right? What does experiment say? Well, uh, one could look at uh, linear speed pole thermograms. This is uh, a plot of the current as a function of potential. And so this is done under two, uh, two different uh, gas purging environments. One is under argon, the other one is under oxygen. Argon is essentially the background current. Now what, I've, what is shown here is, is, is current as a function of potential measured versus lithium lithium plus. The equilibrium potential sits somewhere here. And so we have we have a reduction feature, an oxidation feature uh, that happens at very low over potentials. Uh, but what is essential to realize, and this is extremely important, is unless you you this is this is only a measure of current, so which is essentially only a measure of electrons, right? Unless you calibrate the electrons to the reaction that is going on and in some way quantify electrons to the amount of oxygen consumed or electrons to the amount of oxygen evolved, you cannot say anything conclusive about the reaction that is going on. So this is, uh, this is done in, in, a, in a DEM cell, uh, in, with a, where uh, this is done at IBM, our collaborators who carried out these experiments, where, this, where what they do is they, 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 they design a, a battery and then hook it up to a mass spectrometer and then they can calibrate what are the gas products consumed and what are the gas products uh, uh, evolved. And so what you can extract out of this is a very, very important parameter, which is electrons per oxygen. Right? This is really what you want to know. How many electrons are going towards the reaction I want? Right? This is exactly the question we want to know in batteries, because we want to minimize the, minimize the parasitic reactions as much as possible. And what you see is under discharge, so this is the reduction. Under discharge, the reaction is nearly perfect. It's two electrons per oxygen. Under charge, it's almost perfect at two electrons per oxygen, but then it starts to deviate away also some CO2 and we come back to why this is important. But basically this, this at least reasonably proves that the reaction that is going on under discharge and charge is basically the reduction of oxygen, uh, reduction of oxygen here and then um, evolution of oxygen. So one can carry out a more concrete analysis 
um, to see if we can make a high rate battery out of this. This is this is important if we want to hit high power density. And so uh, these are these are experiments to measure. Uh, these are experiments done on uh, on uh, on uh, model model surfaces which have low surface area. So in this case, if you have a 20 microampere current that corresponds to a 20 milliampere per centimeter square on a real high surface area battery. Uh, and what you see here is uh, the over potential, we'll come back to these features later, just focus on the starting part. The over potential that you have to pay, the over potential penalty that you have to pay is very, very small. And these experiments are essentially done on glassy carbon, so there is no change, no catalyst particles, nothing is needed, dirt cheap. And what you see here is immediately that there is low over potentials during discharge and low over potentials during charge. This is very, very much in line with the kind of predictions that we made. And we can carry out a more, more concrete analysis, that is the, the voltage dependence of the current. And this is done in a, in a Tafel plot where we show log of the current as a function of potential. And this is theory, this is experiments. The most important question that one needs to answer is what is the distance between these two? The distance between these two is the voltage penalty that I have to pay. And what we predict is about 0.3 volts. And what we see in experiments is about 0.4 volts. So it's, very, it's an excellent semi-quantitative agreement uh, with experiments. Uh, we, in fact, even capture some of these, uh, these finer, uh, finer features. There's this non-linearity that comes out because uh, to discharge on a terrace, it costs a high over potential, so that brings this non-linearity in this curve. Uh, and we also, we also show that it's, uh, the charge curve is more, more linear, and that actually, that those features also actually come out really nicely. So what this what this shows is the cycle efficiency of this battery is actually really good. Right? So charge this battery, deep discharge this battery. And so here is the following, following is the observation. So this is what happens when you discharge this battery. Uh, you discharge this battery, it, it runs reasonably well, then it suddenly dies. Right? It just suddenly dies. So what is the reason for this uh, the term sudden death? So what is the reason for this? Now, um, sudden death, basically happens when when some rate does not keep up with the rate at which I need electrons to keep up. So I, I have a constant current condition. So it means that I impose a certain rate of oxygen transport. I impose a certain rate of lithium transport. I also impose a certain rate of electron transport. All three things have to come at a certain rate for that reaction to happen at that reaction site at a certain rate. Right? Now when do you get sudden death? When one of these things is not reaching at the required rate, right? So at the desired rate, it does not reach the desired rate, and so as a result, you have this phenomenon of sudden death. Now, what could it be? Well, uh, we can do a controlled experiment to try and see which one it is. And, and so this is what one, this is what our collaborators at IBM did, where uh, what they looked at was was uh, in a in a in a bulk electrolysis cell. So here uh, you have one one normal lithium TFSI, so you have abundant lithium plus transport and it's rapidly stirred uh, and then you have, you have oxygen dissolved and, and so there are no mass transport limitations associated with oxygen and there are no ion transport limitations associated with lithium plus. The only other thing that is there is electrons. Right? Now here's where the story gets interesting because lithium peroxide is a wide band gap uh, semiconductor. It has a band gap over five dB. So what we wanted to, wanted to see was, was what's the rate of electron transport. And so uh, they did this really nice experiment where uh, they put in a reversible redox couple. Uh, so this is uh, ferrocene ferrocenium. So it is an iron 2 plus to, to iron 3 plus uh, reaction. And so what this measures is the rate at which you produce electrons. So the rate at which you bring electrons to this electrode surface, to this interface essentially, the lithium peroxide interface. And here's the observation. So this is the discharge of the battery. And this is the current that you get out of this ferrocene ferrocenium redox couple. So this is the rate at which you're providing electrons to the surface. And what you, what you see is this is as a function of uh, discharge. So that is at different times, we, we, we stop the battery and then you see what, what current you get, right? And what you see here is the current starts to decay rapidly. Right? These battery, uh, these, uh, these discharges are done at 10 microampere per centimeter square, which, which sits somewhere here. And what you see immediately is that same limit, right? So electrons, you are not able to get electrons to the surface fast enough, right? So because you cannot get electrons to the surface fast enough, your battery suddenly dies. So this is, the, this, is the, this is what this experiment tells us. Now this of course does not tell you what is the mode of conductivity, right? This does not, 
this gives you some hint of what it could be. Uh, you see this uh, exponential dk, and so it gives you some hint of what, what it could be. Um, and so we first looked at what could be the coherent charge transport. This is what is the tunneling of electrons through lithium peroxide. Right? So lithium peroxide is a, is a wide band gap uh, semiconductor, even probably insulator. So what, what we wanted to know was what is the rate at which the electrons are supplied at the chemical potential where this reaction happens. Right? So now, of course, this is the real system. This is an extraordinarily complex system. What you have here is you have a support, and then you have lithium peroxide that's growing, and then you have a site where the reaction happens, and then you have lithium plus, you have oxygen, uh, and then you have electrolyte, and all of these complicated things. This is obviously impossibly hard to model. Right? So we need to try and think through this problem and see if we can model this in a simpler way. One thing that we can do easily is replace glassy carbon, because it's just a metallic contact. right? So uh, gold has a work function that is similar to glassy carbon, so you can replace glassy carbon by gold, and then keep the lithium peroxide. Now we want to replace this part, right? This is the hard part. Now, uh, how do we do this? Well, how can we do this? Well, we can do the following thing, right? Uh, lithium plus and oxygen, two lithium plus and oxygen and electrons react at a certain chemical potential, right? So on a, there is a well-defined chemical potential relative to vacuum where this reaction happens. And so if we can match a material that has a work function which lines up with the chemical potential of this reaction, then you can, you can substitute that also by a metric. It turns out that gold has a work function that is in the range of discharge of this battery. So we, we probe the conductivity of this system in a, in a metal insulator metal configuration. So these are, these are finite bias transport calculations uh, that are carried out uh, in a non-equilibrium Green's function formulation. Uh, but essentially what it does is the following. You have two leads, so here this is gold and gold, and so this gold is, is, is supposed to mimic the support, and this gold is supposed to mimic the electrolyte, and so what you do is you apply a bias across these two, uh, these two leads, and so you apply a bias, and what you see here is the, the plotted effective electrostatic potential, so this is averaged o over the xy plane, and what you see is all the potential drops across the semiconductor, which is not surprising, and, and what we can get out is current, uh, that current that is supported as a function of bias. So as a function of bias that, uh, that you need to apply across these leads. And so what we can extract out of this is what is the thickness dependence, what is the thickness dependence of conductivity across the chemical so This is an intrinsic, an intrinsic property. And so these are calculations that were carried out for lithium peroxide. And then here you have a lithium vacancy. Uh, this is one of the intermediates that this reaction goes through. But what you see is the following. These are bias, bias on the x-axis, current supported on the, uh, on the y-axis. And so if you take a slice at a constant bias, uh, I don't know the colors don't come out that well, but this is three layers, this is five layers, this is seven layers, and this is nine layers. And so if you take a constant, constant bias slice, what you see is the current drops dramatically. I can plot this in a slightly different way. We plot this on a log scale. So this is, this is a part of log of the current supported at a fixed bias. And what you see is, this is minus 14 on the scale is where, uh, where the experiment was carried out. And what you see is, uh, this, has a, this has a cutoff length, uh, which is off the order of 5 to 6 nanometers. So what that means is, this battery, when you grow 5 to 6 nanometers of lithium peroxide, it just dies. That's not a very, uh, very good thing for this battery. That's actually a really, really sad part of this part. Uh, now you can you can take all of this, all of these calculations, and put that together in a in a in a rigorous mathematical model, and then you can reproduce the uh, the features of this experiment. And and really, the sudden death is basically because you cannot get electrons fast enough to the surface. And so that's really uh, that's really what is killing this battery. Um, I started out by saying the discharge and charging cycles are extremely efficient. So if that was the case, then we should essentially get a box curve with uh, the discharge being at the discharge over potential and charge being at charging over potential. It starts out that way, then something goes wrong. Right? Something goes really wrong. And so what is that? So here's the story we put together uh, based on the following observation. The observations are following. So these are again dense measurements where uh, we measured, uh, uh, where I, uh, our collaborators measured the, the, uh, the oxygen or the gases coming out when you charge this battery. So you, initially you get out oxygen, but then finally 
we get out a small amount of CO2 here. Uh, and, and so uh, there, are two possible, uh, there are two possible ways in which you can get CO2. You have carbon, classy carbon, as an electrode. So you can get CO2 from there. And you have the electrolyte, which has uh, dimethyl ether. So there's some carbon there. So uh, it could come from there. And so using isotopic labeling, so they used the C13 electrode, what, what, what was concluded was there was half and half. So half CO2 comes from the, from the carbon and half CO2 comes from the electrolyte. Uh, one other thing is, is to look at uh, what is the electron count per oxygen during discharge. It's nearly perfect two electrons per oxygen. When you charge it, it goes to about 2.7 electrons per oxygen. Right? So there's something that goes wrong during charge. And so here's the story that, that, that uh, essentially I and Alan put together. And, and uh, uh, this was in April of last year, and I think there's now tremendous microscopic uh, imaging that supports various parts of the story. The story is the following. So once you complete the discharge cycle, you have a nearly perfect reaction. You have almost all lithium peroxide, but except for one thing. What you do is lithium peroxide and carbon react to form a thin lithium carbonate layer, very thin. The, the reason this is thin is because you no longer, after this layer, you no longer have access to carbon. So it's self killing. There's a very thin layer of lithium carbonate. Now when you charge this battery, then you of course evolve oxygen. But at the same time, there's some bad reaction, right? some degradation of the electrolyte that starts to coat the surface. Right? Now, because this coats the surface, the number of active sites goes down. And so in order to make the, in order to keep constant current, you need to drive up the overpotential because you have lesser number of sites and so you have to turn over faster on those sites and so you go up in overpotential and so that's why uh, we have this rising region until you get to a point where you have to get rid of the CO2 and so only when you get rid of that CO2 can you cycle this back. It's actually this, this tremendous evidence that this model uh, is uh, reasonably accurate. What you do is when you cycle this battery, you grow thicker and thicker layers of lithium carbonate which is exactly to be expected because if you don't cycle it all the way out and remove this lithium carbonate layer, you grow thicker and thicker. Uh, you grow a thicker and thicker film of, uh, of lithium carbonate to a point where you actually even grow a crystalline lithium carbonate. Okay. So uh, uh, if you take the story that I showed here and then put it into a rigorous mathematical model, uh, and then and then uh, this is comparisons of, of my model to the to the experiments. Uh, these are done on on flat electrode experiments, and, and what we see here is is reasonable comparison. The low overpotential region, this is where the charging is good. Then you have a region where you have a, you have a rising potential. The reason for this is just because you have some reaction that coats the surface and so you lower the number of active sites and so you need to turn over at a faster rate on the sites that you have. And then you have to go to a point where, uh, where you have to get rid of the CO2. So this is essentially where we are in lithium air. That, that movie essentially summarizes where we are. So this, the voltage efficiency, this is the good of this battery. Okay. Um, the bad, the bad I think is the problem of rechargeability. So the electrolyte that degrades and, and prevents cycling. And the reason I call this the bad is because uh, I think organic chemistry is so rich that, that I'm sure we might find an electrolyte uh, that actually does the job. The ugly is the conductivity problem. The reason I call this ugly is because uh, lithium, the traditional strategies of doping uh, is first of all difficult to implement and secondly may not even work in this case because uh, lithium, uh, lithium peroxide, it turns out that when you, when you introduce vacancies, it starts to trap, uh, trap holes, which is the mode of conductivity. So uh, I think uh, conductivity is a huge problem uh, in this case.